Okay, bear with me. Just a second. Uh, good morning, Sonia. Thank you. Good morning. I appreciate it. And hold on. Uh, bear with me for one more second. Okay. Oh, let me, uh, hold on. Okay, we're about to get, oh, right. Sorry. Uh, good morning, Sonia. I said that. Sorry. Good morning, Catherine. Thank you. Good morning, Aja. Thank you. Okay. Again, the only thing anybody's, so I don't have the exams. It, like it says right there, my bad reflects nothing apart on the part of your exams or anything like that. Um, uh, uh, so once I get it back to you, then we'll talk about them. We'll see if you, anybody needs to do test corrections or anything like that, blah, blah, blah. But, um, Okay, but now we just, we need to get back to uh, Newton. Um, and I'm still in my mind, if I recall, you, you, yes, I think I know where you are in lab and stuff like that. But if at any, I'm gonna go on with Newton today now, uh, but if at any point I say anything, well, first of all, as usual, just interrupt me with questions and stuff. Like there is, you know, I may get into kind of a lectury mode by accident because this is sort of thick new material. But if at any moment, besides just please interrupt me with questions, please do. Like, I'll just forget myself if you don't. And it, it won't be an interruption. It's, it's legit. But specifically, if I say anything this period that, oh, and sorry, if I say anything in this period that, um, that uh, uh, in any way reminds you of anything that's due in the lab or anything that you're doing in lab. If anything I say at all relates to lab in any way and motivates any question there. Wait, oh, someone's here, sorry. Please stop me. And I mean like literally like even if it's like, like it's not cheating if you ask me to help you with anything that's due for Professor Wu. That is not only not cheating, that's like awesome. If the more we can stay connected, we're not, you know, it's not supposed to be two ships in the night. I mean, I know that lab is always ahead of lecture, yada, yada, but, but it, it, it's like the best thing you can do to use one of us as a resource with regards to the other. So please, please, if I say anything today, it even reminds you of something in lab. And it, like, even if you think it's like off the topic of me, I would feel like this is even that much more productive if you viewed my time as like recitation for lab, like particularly when, cause nothing is due for me right now, but I know you guys have things due for him. So, so please understand that. And I'm gonna ask you to pause for one more second. And in, and in fact, you can even like, you know, if you're something that's burning in anybody's mind right now about anything in lab, you can just ask me. You don't even have to wait for me to remind you. Like really, really, I would feel like a more useful person if I could be helping people with labs. So don't be shy about that, please. Um, but all that said, I'm just gonna like go back to where we were. Yeah, the very, so I'm using the same notes as from last time, just to stay on, you know, uh, for whatever it's worth. Uh, so, right, so in my opinion, what the, I tried to accomplish last time, Wednesday, was to sh to transition us into Newton's three laws of motion, which are laws that you know you've probably heard in middle school or high school or whatever. I mean, they're pretty common. They're certainly very very important. 
um, the first thing I want to get people to understand or was sort of trying to explain on Wednesday is that these laws of motion didn't come out of nowhere. What they really are is, um, is a formalization or um, 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 mathematization of the concept that had already been laid down by Galileo. And Newton is very conscious of that. It's, I mean, it, I mean, it does happen to be a weird coincidence that Galileo died. And in that very same year, in fact, on Christmas, Newton was born. Like some people get very mystical about that connection. And, and then there's some weird thing too about then like the year that something about when Newton died, then something, 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 then Einstein was born. I mean, it was definitely not in the same year, like not by a long shot, but you know, people can get, and then something happened with Stephen Hawking. People can get very mystical about these things, but, but, but the real point is that Newton's work is very, is very consciously an extension of Galileo's work. Um, um, and that's how I think it's best to see it that way, to understand that everything we're gonna say about forces now is just the next step of recognizing that velocity is a relation always between two objects, never a property of one. Okay, and I know I keep saying that, but, but that's because like the more you can actually believe that even in circumstances where you wouldn't think that it would be true, the more you're really doing physics and the more you really show yourself how to set up problems and set up equations and derive them. And the more you see how the math is actually just turning of the crank. Like the, like the, the hub of physics is, is getting one's mind around Galileo's principle of relativity. So um, if we look at, so here's law number one. Like we wrote it last Wednesday, you've heard it before, but now I want to just sort of somewhat quickly show you what I mean to say when I say Newton, this is Newton's law number one, Newton's law of motion, the first one. It comes from a book, a very famous book called the Principia Mathematica that Newton published in 17. Uh, I don't exactly remember what you could probably look, Google it right now while I'm talking, but I mean, Newton was alive from six. To 1727, the Principia is published during his lifetime. Um, and this first law of motion, okay, this first law of motion has kind of three parts to it. And again, you may have heard it phrased different ways. I would like you to get used to my phrasing. This is, it, it's just my phrasing. Like Newton did not, um, even though he was British, I mean, he lived in what we now call Great Britain and worked there, he wrote the Principia in Latin. Um, so any, so even if I quoted it directly, it wouldn't be English anyway. So some kind of, you know, paraphrasing has to go on no matter what, but it's, so there's some flexibility about the word some, but only some, like it's pretty important to get the structure of this law correct. So, so I'm looking at it right here on the page. I mean, I hope you see it. Um, uh, notice that it kind of has three parts. It first says, unless blah, 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 blah. And then it says, case one talks about an object that's at rest. And then it refers to case two, an object that's not at rest. Okay, so first of all, let's deal with this unless business. The unless part at the beginning says, unless acted on by a net external force. That right away says that this law, it is a law. It's a law, it will have no exceptions, really. It will have no exception. It's not like, well, anyway, it'll have no exceptions. It will have no, um, gray areas, it really is a absolute law, but that doesn't mean that it applies to all the cases in the universe. Like it doesn't apply to, you know, it, it's a, a law of motion. It's not a law of, of, of taxation or so. Like it doesn't have anything to do with money. It doesn't have anything to do with colors. It has to do with motion. So, you know, so its domain is specific, but now it's even more specific than that. This law is a law that is about objects that are not being acted on by forces. Um, uh, now we have to, def we don't, we have not used the word force in this class yet. We don't have a strict definition of it yet in this class. And just to be clear, neither did anybody reading Newton's book when it first came out. Um, um, I mean, Newton was using a word that he figured people had a certain intuition about, a certain basic idea, just like I'm going to assume you have a basic idea of what a force is. Um, uh, but the strict definition of a force actually is going to come out of these three laws. These three laws are ultimately about what a force is and what it does. So right now, what, it, what do I think of as a force? What is a force? And maybe you want to, yeah, I guess we should write this one. Oh, sorry, I did not mean to do that. Okay.
Okay. The basic idea of a force that I want us that that Newman kind of is assuming that people would already have in their mind when they're reading this point. So I, I'm going to I'm going to tell you what that assumption is. Like either you already have this in your mind, or I'm telling you right now what basically to think of as a force as we look at the first laws. Think of a force as a push or a pull, and more specifically, think of a force as something that is done by one object to another. It I mean, the fast way to say a force is it's at a push or a pull. But when you think about pushes or pulls, the most important thing to realize consciously that like, like is probably in your unconscious mind is when you think of pushes or pulls, whenever you try to picture them in your mind of any kind, you automatically, I hope, picture something pushing or pulling something else. And that is key to the definition of a force. Whatever a force is, like mathematically or specifically, it's something that one thing does to another. In other words, before we go any further, I want everybody to recognize that this is much like what we're saying about velocity, like this picks up on the spirit of velocity that force cannot exist by itself. And one object by itself cannot do a force or experience a force or have a force. If you ever hear in like, or read in the newspaper or something like that, or like you're watching a baseball game and something talk, someone talks about like, oh my God, the force of that baseball pitch was so high, like the guy couldn't even hit it or something. Or they talk about the force. If anybody ever says something about the force of a baseball or the force of a baseball bat or the force of a bullet in a gun, that's just wrong. That's a total misuse of the word. It's, and it, creates all kinds of confusing images and, and miscalculations. No object by itself can have a force. I mean, maybe in Star Wars, but like in physics, in science, no object by itself can have a force any more than any object by itself can have a velocity, okay? A force is necessarily some kind of relation between two objects. That's the first thing I wanna say. So that more specifically, if we go back to this first law that we're looking at here, well, actually, we're yeah. Okay, the first thing I want to make clear then is Newton's first law, when it opens up with this idea, unless acted on by a hoobie dabba dee dabba dee, like net external force, blah, blah. Before you get into all the deep, the point of that unless is it's telling us right away that we are about to make a, a claim that, that, that this first law of motion is the first law of motion for a reason. It tells us what to expect of any single solitary lone object by itself, it tells us what we should expect regarding motion, how, how what kind of motion or non-motion or whatever we should expect of an object when the object is in isolation, is not being affected by any other object. That's the key, okay? The first law, in other words, the first law, some people call it like the natural state of objects, like what objects would naturally do if they weren't being messed with by other objects. Or you might, as a scientist, like, like, like again, Newton and Galileo are sort of like beginning the scientific method, but now we have it. Now you guys are very used to science. So you might even consider the, the first law like the base case or the control, so to speak. It's what we expect to happen when nothing interesting is going on. 
what we expect to happen to a object if no other objects are in any way influencing it or interacting with it or anything like that. Okay, that's what the unless part is saying. Is it's, it's saying we're about to get into the laws of motion. So the first thing to establish is what type of motion do we expect in the most uninteresting blase natural state of affairs? When a planet or an electron or a baseball or whatever, whatever is by itself, okay? So, so, so that's what, so I'm gonna go back to the law. So, right, so here's the law again. So unless acted on by a net external force, all that is a fancy way of, of discounting everything we're not about to talk about in this law. We're, we're not talking about two objects interacting together. We're not talking about one object being affected by Earth's gravity or one object being affected by the friction of a table underneath or anything. We're just talking about what you, okay, I think you get the point. That's what the first part means. Now it says, once we're all agreed that we're just gonna look at the base case here, like what do we, how do we expect objects to move when nothing interesting is going on, well, it says there's two cases. You can, you can talk about what we expect to happen to an object that happens to already be sitting still when we like walk into the room or walk into the lab and look at it or start making observations and measurements. Or we, like that's one case, or we can talk about when that's not happening, when we walk into the lab or the room or the outer space station and we start making observations on an object that happens already to be moving the moment we walk in. Now, those are the only two possible cases, right? Either something is moving or it's not moving. I mean, similarly, we could say either an object is red in color or it's not, and that would cover all the objects in the universe. But, right, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is just logic. Like, something either is tall or it's not tall once you define tall. So I could make this kind of subdivision about it, like, with, with, with certainty, no matter what, like I, I know that if a law has two cases, the X case and the not X case, then I've covered all the cases. Here, we don't happen to care about color or size or anything else. We care about motion. These are laws of motion. So we're going to look at the two cases, an object that happens already to be moving when we walk in and an object that happens not to be. Like, that's it. That's the universe right there. Okay, so first we deal with the more obvious case, the case where something is not moving when you walk in, okay? And what we say is, and I'm sure it seems obvious to everybody because it kind of is. Like what we're saying is if you walk into a room and you see a Coke bottle sitting on your desk, like if the moment you walk in, it's sitting on your desk. And the moment you start your stopwatch and start making observations or measurements on this thing, like start doing experiment, if it happens to be sitting on your desk stably when you walk in, what we expect is that, the, and again, I shouldn't even say on your desk, like on a rink of ice or something like that, like sitting around, just not being affected by anything else, if it's just sitting around and it's not affected by anything else, all of us, I think, would expect no change. Like we would, I when I walk into my room to start teaching and there's a, or there's a calculator on my desk, I don't worry that all of a sudden the calculator is going to spontaneously fly up or fly to the left or something. I mean, maybe if I bump the calculator, it will or the Coke bottle, or whatever. But not. But it's pretty straightforward and I think intuitive to most people that think stuff that are, is sitting around, you expect to continue sitting around. One of the reasons I think that's obvious and like I shouldn't spend too much time on it is that everybody that did anything that you might ever call physics before Newton and before Galileo, such as Aristotle, like 2000 years before them, anybody who ever wrote anything down about what they might consider natural philosophy, like whatever they called it, said the same thing. Like everybody through the ages, and there are laws to this effect. I mean, Aristotle had laws of motion 2000 years before Newton. Many of them turn out to be what we would now consider to be wrong. But one of them was that an object at rest would stay at rest. And like, like this is not news. No one, okay, it's not revolutionary. The first part. So, so far I'm saying that I haven't, I'm spending all this time to say that so far most of the first law is not particularly new or interesting and shouldn't surprise you and you probably wonder why I'm spending so much time talking about it. Like so far we're just saying if an object is left alone and it's just sitting there, we expect it to keep sitting there. Okay, duh. But now the second part, you know, which you've heard before and maybe you have thought about or I don't know what you thought about it, but the second part says, however, if you walk into the room or the lab or the observation space, 
and it happens to be the case that something's already moving, like like maybe you know someone's for whatever reason, like you walk in and there's a baseball flying across the room because maybe somebody threw it two minutes ago, like or 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 you're in outer space and you're looking at the Earth as it's going past the sun or uh, some meteor going past Earth or something. If for whatever reason you start making observations on an object when it already happens to be in motion, now Newton says if we're still assuming that nothing else is interacting with that object or nothing else is influencing it, if we're still being strict about that assumption, which we made a big deal of at the beginning, if we're talking about an object by itself, not touching another object, not being pulled by Earth's gravity, not rubbing against like the, the rough surface of another object. So like, like not even, so like maybe a hockey puck, maybe we're talking about a hockey puck that's like zooming across the room, we happen to walk in. But if we're talking about a hockey puck, we're talking about one that's sliding across super, super smooth ice or an air hockey table or something, not a hockey puck that's moving along like sandpaper because sandpaper is definitely rough and definitely is another object that will affect the hockey puck. So I don't, we're not saying anything about that yet. In this law, we're talking about something that's moving when we happen to be looking and seemingly by itself. If we see such a thing, then the expectation this law says is we should expect that that object would keep going forever, would, would, or at least until the situation changes, should keep going at the same speed and in the same direction, right? Now, I, I know, again, I know you've heard this before and I know people have thought about this before one way or another, like, a, a, now, but this is now kind of a big deal because quite frankly, like this is the opposite of what Aristotle said 2000 years prior. Aristotle, I mean, in different words said objects that are at rest will stay at rest and objects that are in motion will slow down until they stop. That was like a law of motion. I mean, it was more detailed than that. But Aristotle, as the great natural philosopher whose work reigned supreme for thousands of years, or well, 2,000 years, his point was any object that's moving when, when you're paying attention will, yeah, will continue to move, but it'll slow down and slow down until it stops. And the reason Aristotle said that was be, not because he's an idiot by any means, but because, in fact, that's the way it tends to look and seem in our common everyday experience, like, I mean, and again, I know you know this, but I'm just trying to put it in perspective. Like, you know, you, 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 if you put a hockey puck down on a rut on, on the floor and you slap it on the floor, like on a wooden floor, let's say you put a hockey puck down and you slap it with a stick, it's going to move. I guess this was one of the problems on the exam. In fact, it's going to move for a while, but in our common experiences, it's going to slow down until it stops. And our common experience of cars and bicycles and stuff is like, if just left alone, seemingly left alone, they'll eventually slow down and stop. And that's why we have to put gas in cars. And that's why we spend all this money and stuff on like energy production. And then we have energy crises and all this. Like we all intuitively know, or we intuitively think that we know that in order to keep things going, it requires, objects require some sort of help or assistance or energy or fuel or something. That's how it sort of seems when we navigate through daily life, just like it seems that the earth is sitting still when we navigate through daily life. But what Newton's saying here is what he's saying, and again, I know that in some ways you've thought, you've probably reconciled this before, maybe even in seventh grade, but let's just get it straight. Like the first part of this law says, we are not talking about objects interacting with each other. I.e., even if we're gonna picture a hockey puck now, if we're gonna picture a hockey puck, if we're gonna picture it at all, like on a surface, we better not picture it on a rough surface because the rough surface would be another object that would be interacting with it. And we'll have to get into that in other laws. We, if we wanna picture a hockey puck, we wanna picture it on a super, super smooth situation, like a no friction situation. And what we are saying here is if we actually picture that or picture a car, like not on the street and not with perfectly round tire, sorry, picture a car on a street, but with maybe like not so well inflated tires or even, you know, or like a Flintstone would be able to sort of squarish tires, like picture or picture a sliding cart rather than a car. In other words, um, wait, am I saying, yeah, I'm saying, wait, so, I'm sorry, the opposite picture a car with really well inflated tires and like a really smooth street or whatever, whatever, like picture a car on, 
a really, really smooth surface. And then you'll start to realize like, oh no, if it was really smooth or God forbid, if, if, if the hockey puck or the car is like even shot into outer space where there's literally no surface and no air to drag it, then what we're claiming here is that object would not slow down and it would not turn. It would go forever in a straight line. That's what this is saying. Now it's important, even though I know many of you have heard this and maybe you've even satisfied yourself, like, like this is supposed to be a surprise. This is not what Aristotle said. And it's not how we generally act through life. We generally act like for things to keep going, we need to help them. This is saying, no, if you don't help them and you don't mess with them at all, they will keep going on their own. They don't need help to keep going. And, and what it's talking about is like the ideal or infinitely optimum case of no friction, no gravity, blah, blah, blah. And, and again, you might have told yourself that five years ago and like realized, okay, this law, it, does, it sounds wrong, but I guess it's right because it's just talking about like the ideal case. But why I wanna pause on it for so long is say, if you're anything like me or many other people, even if you work this out in your mind in seventh grade, then what would tend to happen is well, if you're me, then what happened to me is I understood, I was like, oh, okay, they're talking about no friction. Okay, they're talking about like the ideal case, like an outer space or on a perfect air hockey table or something like that. So I was like, all right, I get that. Yeah, if there were, I get that things always slow down because of friction, I guess. And I guess I understand that. I guess if you took away the friction, I guess we're saying they wouldn't slow down. But my reaction to that was twofold. One, how the heck do you know that? How can you say you, Newton, how can you say that's a law if every situation we've ever seen in our life does have some friction? Like I've never been to outer space and Newton certainly was never, like, even though there have now been people on the moon, that was way after Newton. So Newton never went to the moon. Newton was never in outer space. I certainly have never been in outer space. I mean, except in my head. Um, and um, and I've seen some pretty good ice hockey rinks. I mean, I actually, you know, I, I, I have been, I have gone ice skating and stuff and I see how it's smoother, but even there, like I didn't go onto an ice skating rink like one second after the Zamboni did its thing. Like even that ice was not perfect. And like, even I had to keep myself going trying to skate on the ice. So first of all, I'm thinking, where are you even getting this? Like, well, how can you be so audacious to even say this? Like if you, we've never experienced it. And number two, more importantly, what I thought, whether consciously or not, I thought, look, even if you do know this is true, you, Newton, because you're like such a genius scientist or whatever, even if it is true that in the ideal case of outer space or something that this is true, who freaking cares? Like, like, I thought we were supposed to be doing science here. I thought we were supposed to be doing physics, like making predictions about the world that are going to actually help us or maybe help us fire cannons and win wars, which is kind of what Newton's point was, or, or something like that. Like if it's just about deep outer space or some perfect hockey rink, seriously, that sounds like Smurf Village to me. I mean, that, like that it sounds like some cool philosophical point that like interesting in theory to think about, but if it doesn't have to do with the real world, why should I care? And how could it be such a fundamental law? Like those were basically my two reactions in some form or another. And if either of those reactions is what, and I'm not even sure I consciously understood those were my reactions, but I definitely did not think this law was a big deal. And I didn't know why I had to care. Um, and those were essentially the reasons why. So if you're thinking anything like that, good, especially if you're conscious that you're thinking that, good because that's a reasonable concern, but here's the answer, or here's my answer. And in fact, let me write this down. Hold on, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so I'm saying 
two reason, very reasonable objections to Newton's first law are two very reasonable reasons to be confused are these. One, how did he know it was true? And two, why should we care? And again, let me say like always, it's, it's great if you have these objections. Why would I say it's great? Even though, of course, I want you to believe Newton's first law ultimately, and I want you to hear me say why I think it's important. The reason I think it's great if you do have either of these objections is because that would mean that you know that you have these objections. The scariest part is to have a discomfort with the law or some basic rejection of the law in your soul, but not even be able to articulate to yourself why, to not even recognize that you don't like the law. That's where it gets like, in other words, just be like, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it, and write it down. Like, okay, I memorized the first one, which is of course how many of us get through a lot of school. That's the dangerous thing to do because the fact is it is a controversial law and it is actually saying something new. And if you just write it down, you're like, yeah, yeah, I guess it's true because of my teacher saying so and like Newton said so, so, okay, okay. You'll actually never be able to apply the law correctly or do anything with it if you just accept it, because it actually is too weird just to accept. The best thing is to momentarily, always in physics, it's always best to be confused at first and know why you're confused. And then we can straighten it out and move on. Like this is what physics is all about. So I'm very happy if any of you is listening to this at all and thinking like, I, this is like stupid. That's fine by me. What would not be as fine for you to just be like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Can we go on? Like, cause, cause no, it's not that simple. Okay. so. So my two objections to entertain for a moment are why, how could he think this is true and why should he think it matters that it's true? Okay, so I'm gonna address, this. so what are my answers? Or actually, I'll pop, I'm gonna, well, if anybody wants to intervene and interject, oh, and I forgot to put the, I'll put the game assignment in, I'm sorry, I'll take that in a second. But if anybody wants to like volunteer an answer to either of these questions, I'm all ears. I mean, I'm all, I, I'm going fast just because, you know, because I am, but, or I'm whatever, but please put in the chat or whatever, if you think you have a thought about either of these, or if you want me to back up, but if not, I will tell you what I think. Okay, first reason we even know it's true or what, what, well, I shouldn't say no, but why he would even believe it's true in the first place, even though he's never been to outer space or to a perfect like ice skating rink is from what we call successive approximations, like not successful, but successive approximations, successive meaning one after another after another. Um, the idea is this. I've never seen a perfect, I've never seen ice that was perfectly free of friction. I have not. But what I have seen is the opposite. I've seen like sandpaper, like I've seen a really rough surface. And I know that if I put a hockey puck on sandpaper and give it a push, it'll go like an inch and then it's gonna stop. Like if the surface is really rough, if there's a lot of friction, if I put a hockey puck or something on it, it will go for a very short amount of, it will slow down, it'll decelerate really rapidly and come to rest on sandpaper, which again is why most people would think, well, automatically objects like slow down. But then I say to myself, I think that has something to do with the sandpaper. I don't think the object itself is automatically slowing down. I think it's because the surface below it. So I smooth out the sandpaper slightly, like I make it somewhat smoother and I flick the, a uh, hockey puck and of course, lo and behold, maybe not surprisingly, this time the hockey puck takes, goes a little farther before it comes to rest. Like it takes a little bit longer to slow down. It decelerates at a, or it negatively accelerates at a smaller rate. Then I smooth down more and the hockey puck does even, goes even farther. Then I take away the sandpaper and put down wood 
you know, and this the hockey puck goes even farther. And then I polish the wood. And of course I'm exaggerating or being dramatic, but like the point is under controlled circumstances, now that Galileo has given us a, the scientific method, has given us the idea of an experimental method where you hold all variables still, except for one that you want to test. And you, you know, you have a control and all these kind of things that you learned in seventh grade that, that people did not do before Galileo. Like, like, People like Aristotle, they did make observations, they did look at the world, and they did think really hard and really mathematically. But what they didn't do is control their observations the way Galileo did. They didn't separate variables the way Galileo did. Now Galileo gives us that. Now Newton is doing that in his lab, in his home. And so what Newton is, in a, is noticing is, ah, the less friction there is, the farther this object goes before, whatever object goes before stopping. And he can even now, he can even make a, there's even methods of graphing and stuff like that. So you can imagine he could even make a graph, like put on the x-axis how much friction there is. And he can put on the y-axis the rate of acceleration or deceleration. And he can make a trend line from each, each successive trial he does. And so the first thing is that he sees a pattern. The pattern is the less friction there is, the farther the object goes before stopping. So then if you take this graph to the limit, if you extrapolate all the way to infinity, if you, and it is extrapolating, you could call it imagining or you could call it inferring, but it's, you know, he, he has to take his mind to a place that the data doesn't go. But his mind isn't just making a leap. It's not just in making up something out of nowhere. It's extrapolating. It's taking something to the limit as some variable. I'm just calling it Z, like I, whatever the variable is in this case, maybe the coefficient of friction or, or the, 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 the inverse of that, like the not friction. What Newton does for the first time is extrapolate to infinity. He can't see infinity. He cannot make a measurement at infinity. He cannot, uh, like, he cannot quantify anything about infinity, but he can believe in the power, of, he can believe and, and rely on a trend that takes him to infinity. And this is the beginning of the limit concept. And it's not a coincidence that Newton, besides giving us this law of motion, is also the same man who, in another part of the same book, starts giving us and he's not the only man, but he is a, a, one of the first people to, in another part of the book, start giving us the underpinnings of what we now call differential calculus. Like, you know, calculus begins with the notion of limits, the idea that you can, ex that even though infinity is not a number, we can still say things about, and even though infinity is beyond our mind, like our minds are finite, the space of our lab is finite, the time for any measurement is finite, but yet, Starting with Newton, we start having a very sort of rigorous, precise way of making claims about what happens at infinity because we look at the trends that go toward infinity. So first and foremost is he extrapolates. The, he says the, the less friction there is, the farther something goes without stopping, I extrapolate that if there was literally no friction at all, then the object literally would have to. He basically says, I think friction is the reason this thing's stopping. So if there was no friction, all it would stop. All maybe sounds very obvious to you now, I don't know, but this is the birth of not only a big part of classical physics, but also calculus, this idea that we can believe. Like science is still always gonna be tethered to, science is always gonna be rooted in that which we can see, feel, hear, touch, and smell. But it doesn't mean we can't say things about stuff that we can't see, hear, touch, feel, and smell. And in fact, to physics 204, which I have to admit is much more calculus oriented than physics 203. Like, believe me, all the prereqs that you had to take, whether you're happy about them or not, they really, really come into play in physics 204. We, it's very mathematical. It's much more calculus driven than this in a direct way, but also because physics 204 is fundamentally about things in space and time that we cannot feel, touch, see, or smell. Like things like sound waves or electric, electrical currents or electrical fields or electromagnetic radiation, which we call light. Like that's what physics 204 is about. I mean, I love it for that reason. It's about abstract stuff. And here in physics is the stage where we start being able to believe that even though physics ultimately gets all of its data and all of its confidence 
from our five senses, we can still use our mind to extrapolate from the five senses to the realm of infinity and make claims about it. That's what's exciting about calculus and higher level physics. Okay? So anyway, so that's the first thing is he uses successive approximations. That's why we now believe the first law. The other reason we believe the first law is, is and I don't want to overdwell on this, I know, I, but it always comes back to this. The other reason is Galileo's principle of relativity. If you think of, and I, so remember, I'm saying that Newton's, New, what we call Newton's first law of motion is in fact simply the sixth different way, it's the sixth different way to say that all velocities are relative. Put another way what I'm trying to say is if you really think about it, the minute you the minute you decide to believe that the earth is actually moving all the time at 65,000 miles an hour, and yet you don't feel it at all or see it or touch it. Like that there's no direct evidence in your daily life of the earth doing anything but sitting still. And yet somehow we can believe that it's moving this fast all the time. Like that still bothers me. Like that still should occasionally bother you. Like, wait, is the earth moving or not? Like, how could it be moving this fast? And yet I don't feel it. Or like, is the train moving or not? Like that whole deal that, you, that there's no answer to that question that, that the earth is moving relative to the sun, but it is not moving relative to itself. And that by the way, e even if you, and I should be more even clear, but even when you get your mind around the fact that the earth is moving at 65,000 miles an hour past the sun, and that's already kind of a dizzying number, I think like that is again, faster than any rocket ship ever goes. I mean, not by a lot, but it is. Um, and, I'm, and rocket ships someday will go faster, but it's like really, really fast. It's definitely faster than any airplane goes. But just when you get in mind around that, like I also want to make clear that, or I used to think when I finally kind of okay, the Earth is going around the sun. I guess I bought, I sort of bought it in third grade. I made the solar system project out of fruit, whatever. But I still kind of could get comfortable with it because I was like, oh, I get all right. I guess like I thought the Earth was the center in my own weird way, but I guess it's not. I guess it goes around the sun. I guess the sun is the center, and the sun is sitting there. But but no, like we don't believe that either. Just to be clear, like. The sun itself is not sitting still, but in, by any reckoning, the sun is moving past what we call the galactic center, the center of the galaxy. Now, even this Newton didn't know, but the sun is moving past the galactic center at speeds that are upwards of 650,000 miles an hour. Like that's more than a half million miles per hour. That's what the sun is doing. So don't for a minute think like, well, I guess I felt stable, but I'm not really, but I guess I'm at least in a solar system that's stable. No, the whole freaking solar system is going like this all the time. There's no stability, only there is stability relative to itself. Well, once you get your mind around that, or once you accept that as a truth, then actually, it actually just directly follows from that, that objects do not naturally slow down on their own because we're saying objects naturally on their own don't have any kind of speed. They don't have a speed of 65. They don't have a speed of zero. No object by itself has any speed, let alone is it trying to get to any kind of speed. Like this idea that objects, if need help to move, which is like intuitively what we all think in America, like, oh, we need gas to put in the car to get the car to move. Or if I want my kid to move, I gotta push my kid or whatever. Like we all think the objects need help to move, meaning we automatically think objects naturally want to be at speed zero. No, naturally objects don't have or know anything about or want to be at any speed. Like there's no such thing as speed zero for an object. And it's all about frame of reference. Object moves zero relative to itself, but it moves at some speed relative to me and it moves at a different speed relative to you. So put one last final way. What I, like if you really buy Galileo's principle of relativity, then it has to be the case, in other words, that it's no more natural for an object to sit still, that, whoops, sorry. It's no more natural for an object to sit still than it is for it to keep going. Objects do not naturally want to sit still. What they naturally want to do is not change what they're doing. That's what's, some people call this the law of inertia. 
objects just naturally, if left alone, just will keep doing whatever they're doing. And whether you call that zero, you call 500, that's all a matter of what perspective you're in. Um, okay. So that's the two reasons I believe this law is one, because of successive approximations, and two, because if I'm willing to believe the Earth is moving, then there's no reason not to believe this law. Like, it, the point is, there's no such thing as speed zero, period. So this law follows, okay? Why should I care? Okay, the reason we should care is kind of what I said a couple minutes ago that, that we're, what we really care about here is how objects move. What we do care about is the real world, of course. What we really do want to know is we want to have some ability to predict how a hockey puck will move or decelerate or where it's going to end up in a certain amount of time in the regular real world case of a hockey puck actually being on some sort of surface that actually does have friction. Like, we, of course, care about the real world. And our goal here is to predict motion, right? The goal always of physics is where will something be when? All of physics is about stuff in space and time. All of physics is about if you tell me where this object is now and, and something like how fast it's going, then I want to be able to tell you where this object will be in five minutes. Or I want to be able to tell you how many minutes it'll take for this object to get over there. Whether this object is a like a, a ballistic, like a weapon, like you looked at in lab four and which is sort of like where physics first got its funding in the 17th century, like, like people cared about it because it helped with weaponry um, and continues to, um, or whether it's because I want to predict something about planets and, 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 and um, celestial bodies in outer space, whatever it is, I'm, or if it's the modern day and it's you guys and we're in forensic science, if I want to retrodict, if I want to know where something was five minutes ago, or how, like, in other words, again, lab four, if a bullet hit a person and I want to use the laws of physics to extrapolate backwards and figure out where that bullet must have come from, i.e. who was holding the gun or whatever, whether I'm going forward in time or backward in time in my mind, I'm trying to predict the motion of actual objects in the real world. That is, I do want to predict actual objects that are actually being influenced by other objects, whether those other objects be frictional surfaces or gravitational planets or whatever. Yes, what we want to do is predict the real world. But the only way to do that is to have a control or a base case, whatever you want to call it. I need to know first what would happen to an object in the zero influence situation. And, and now I do. And from there, then I can rigorously move to the prediction of what happens when objects are influenced. And that is the second law. Okay, so the second, so the first law is like, what happens to an object when there's no forces acting on it, when there's no second object influencing it, then the second law, which is truly the powerful one, and you notice the second one is written as a math equation, because this is the one that we actually use mathematically to like do everything. 
Like, so the first law we established, we understand it. Now we go to the second law, which we wrote. Where do we go? The second law. Oh, right, sorry. Okay, so the second law is. Right, okay. Is right here, it's on the top. There's a second law. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the second law for a little bit now. now uh, this is where the action is. This, I mean, I know this is like all lab five, lab, you know, is all about this. Like there's a lot of math that comes, this is ends up being the rest of physics always comes back to this law now, the second law. Um, so, so let's analyze it a bit. Actually, wait. Okay, so everything we do in physics, especially everything mathematical and quantitative and precise, starts with the second law. That's where we're going to spend most of our time. Um, so even before, and that's going to, I'm going to spend the rest of like the week on and everything, but, 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 um, But a quick overall summary of it, of the second law is, what it says is, here's what happens when forces do act on an object, specifically on a mass. What they do is they accelerate that mass. Like back to the first law, if, F, if, if, if the force is acting on an object or zero, if there is no force acting on an object or no net force, which I'll get into in a second, um, then it's like the left side of this equation would be zero and therefore the right side would have to be zero. Um, and there's, if you have an object at all with any mass, the M is not gonna be zero. So what the first thing that this law, this, this law is including and subsuming the case of the first law, it's first of all saying, if the net external forces acting on an object are zero, if there's no unbalanced forces acting on an object, then the object will not accelerate. Notice A stands for acceleration. It doesn't say, F equals MV. It doesn't say if there's no force, there's no velocity. It says if there's no net force, there's no acceleration. And remember, acceleration is change in velocity. So this law is now saying specifically that when you push or pull an object, when in an unbalanced way you push or pull some mass, you accelerate it. Now, acceleration is change in velocity. That means either a change in speed or a change in direction or both, right? Because velocity is speed and direction. So this law, um, so this law is not saying that you need forces in order to move. It's saying you need forces in order to change the way you move. And notice there are these arrows above the letters. There's an arrow above F and there's an arrow above A. Those arrows are vector symbols. They're saying that we're gonna treat acceleration as a vector which we have since day one in this class, meaning it's not just about change in speed, it's change in velocity. Velocity is a vector, meaning it includes the concept of direction. Um, and same thing with force. So we're gonna say accelerations can be positive or negative, and but as vectors, they exist on all, ac like, on all axes at once. What I'm trying to say right now is this includes the concept of direction, so when you exert a force or net force on an object, you accelerate it, but acceleration could be positive or negative. So when, so when you exert a net force on an object, you might speed it up or you might slow it down. In other words, in order for something to slow down or speed up or turn, either way, it needs a net force on it. Things by themselves do not slow down or speed up in order to get them to speed up or slow down or turn. 
you've got to push or pull them. And the more you push or pull, the more you will turn or speed up or slow down. Like in short, that's what this law says. Also that big sigma symbols like the sigma for math, it means sum of. Another way a lot of people write it is, is they'll call it net. Meaning it's not F equals MA, it's net F equals MA or sum of F equal MA, meaning uh, it's the sum of all forces on an object that accelerate it. And when we add up all the forces, we include the concept of direction of negative signs. So if I push you with a hundred units of force, whatever those units are called, we're obviously gonna find out or you probably already know, but if I push you with a hundred newtons of, of force and I push to the north, if at the same time someone else pushes you with 100 units of force to the south, well, that's 100 plus negative 100, that's zero. That would be, we would both be pushing, we'd both be exerting a force, but the net force would be zero. So the acceleration will be zero. What we're interested in here, in other words, the sigma sign means you have to add up all the forces along a given axis and taking into account negative signs. So it often ends up meaning what looks like subtraction. You're always adding up all the forces, but some forces can be negative. So it's only what's left over at the end that accelerates. But the key point that I'm making right now, and then I'll move on, is forces don't velocitize. We don't need forces for motion, and forces don't cause motion. They cause changes in motion, is what this is saying. And again, we're going to do like a lot of math with it. And I know you already have been or are doing in lab four. So we're just trying to catch up, uh, sorry, in lab uh, five. Um, and I know also I'm watching the class. I know there's like 13 minutes left, but in order to put this all together, I do, um, so I'm gonna now skip to the third law, not skip, but I mean, there's much more to be said about the second law. Again, we're gonna use it for the rest of our lives and make the diagrams and everything that you're making in lab. And I'm gonna catch up with that. But let me get to law three before we do all that, because law three, again, it's in English. It's a concept. I know you've heard it your whole lives, many of you. But first of all, it's the concept that is the e most easily misunderstood, especially when it's taught in middle school or something like that. Second of all, because it's a concept. Well, so the reason we really need the third law before I go any further is I'm talking and talking about forces here. But I've just said they're like a push or a pull, they're an interaction, or they're, they're like a force comes from a second object. The more rigorous, precise, concrete way to understand a force actually comes from the third law. In a strange way, the first law tells you what happens when no forces are acting. The second law tells you what happens when there are forces acting. And the third law is the one that actually tells you really what we mean by a force. And I mean, it, no matter what order these laws went in, it would, it's always ultimately like a circle. It goes around and around. Like you, they, it all gets deeper as you look at it over and over again. And any law, like uh, there's, uh, I used to, frankly, I used to think, I used to wish that Newton had made the third law first because I felt like it'd be much easier to understand the whole package and easier to teach. But no matter what you do, there's no clear starting point. The third law, we're, so we're assuming when we start the first and the second law that we have some kind of notion of force in our head. That's the one I gave you five pages ago. Like it's a push or a pull. It's an influence from a second object. The third law tells you what's really going on with forces. The third law is the one that you've as often referred to as action reaction law. You might have even heard it phrased that way. You might have even been taught in seventh grade or sixth grade or 10th grade. You might have, e or you might have read somewhere that Newton's third law is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now, I'm not saying that's false. Like that is true. That is a true implication of the law, but it's not the whole truth. And it's not nothing but the truth. It's one implication of the law that if you just say it by itself, leads to very deep confusions and misunderstandings. So here's the way I say the law. This is what I want. Like, like, I mean, if you say for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Frankly, what I used to always think that meant in, intuitively with that. And I even read this in a book once. It was kind of meant as a joke, but, and I don't, forgive me if this, what I'm about to say might offend somebody or be gross. But like, I used to think that meant that if you sneeze, you automatically have to fart. Like, that's what I thought it meant. I mean, um, like action, reaction, or put less grossly or put like, you know, more reasonably, 
I kind of thought, well, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I kind of thought that meant if gravity is pulling me down right now to the earth, then automatically the chair must be pushing me up and they must be equal and opposite forces. And that's not, that's why I'm not going down or up. Like I thought, oh, earth pulling me down, action, chair pushing me up, reaction. And I thought, oh, they're oppositely directed, but they must be equal in magnitude. So I'm, that's why I'm sitting here and I'm not falling through the chair or rising up in the air. Now, I'm using that example on purpose because like that is a misconception that's in a lot of books and might even be in your head. Like, so let me slow down for a second. I do believe that right now the earth is pulling me down toward the center of the earth. And I believe it's with a certain force with a certain number of Newtons. And in fact, we call that my weight. I also do believe that the chair is pushing me up right now. I do. And you might even know that that's called the normal force of the chair. And that's true. And it, whether that word helps you or not, yes, the chair is pushing me up or, or anything like my coffee cup, like on the desk, right? It is true that the earth is pulling my coffee cup down toward the center of the earth. And by the way, this thing I'm about to say is like very important. And like if you're tuning in and out, this, and you really might be confused on this if you're trying to write up lab five or something, like it's really easy to think you understand this and actually be wrong. I mean, who, I mean, this is just one of those things where you don't know you don't understand it until you do. And sometimes it's too late. So I'm saying, the earth is pulling down on me right now. That's called my weight. Like there is gravity from the center of the earth that's pulling me down. And, it, and so much so that if there weren't a chair between me and the ground, like I would fall to the ground, as you know. It's also true that the chair is pushing like my butt, like up. And I say pushing up, like pushing up. Like you might even think what's well, pushing? It's just an inanimate object. What do you say? Well, I'm not saying it's trying consciously to push. But I am saying that the chair is pushing me up right now. And I know that because if I weren't sitting on a chair, I would fall down, right? So it is like, and I don't know it for other reasons as well. And whether you call it a normal force or not, the chair is pushing up on me right now, or the, the desk is pushing up on my coffee cup right now. So there are two forces that are opposite in direction, the downward weight of my cup which some people call MG and we'll get to that, but like, yes, that's right. If you have it in your lab, it's like the downward force pulling on the cup is called the MG of the cup. And it is true that there's an upward force from the desk pushing the cup up. They are opposite in direction. And it is true that they're equal in magnitude. Like it is true that the debt, oh, sorry. Yes, thank you, Yasmin. Yes, it is true that the upward force from the desk cancels out with the downward weight of the cup. That is totally true. And I'm psyched that Yasmin just said it. And that reminds me that I hope I end like two minutes early because I didn't put your game assignment in and I should. And she totally gets 50 points for that or maybe 75 or whatever. Like, in fact, yeah, she should put that in that, that portal of like for right or for wrong, if you remember what I'm talking about. Like, but anyway, that's totally good and that's true. But now here's why everybody gets confused about this. Cause that is all true that that the forces on the cup right now are equal and opposite. They do cancel each other out. And that's why the cup is not moving. But the important thing for me to say, and I'm going to start with this on Wednesday and say this is, that is totally not, it is true. What Yasmin said was true, but it is not an example of Newton's third law. Like there is, like if you take Newton's third law to say for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's very easy to then think, oh yeah, here's an example. Like action is the earth is pulling down on the cup with a certain number of Newtons of force and reaction, the desk is pushing up on the cup with the equal number of force units and they're canceling each other out so the cup doesn't move. All of that is true except for saying that that's an example of Newton's third law. That is totally, and, and Yasmin never said that. I mean, just to be clear, like nothing that Yasmin said is wrong. I'm talking now about a misconception that could be in the back of our minds and is in textbooks and stuff. It is not the business of the cup, like an up arrow and a down arrow, totally true, but it's an example of Newton's second law. It is not an example of Newton's third law. It's an example of Newton's second law because that's an example where, aha, we have a like positive 100 Newtons or whatever, plus negative 100 Newtons equals zero net force, therefore zero acceleration of the, of the cup, right? But it's not an example of this third law because 
If it were, if that's what the third law meant, that for every action, there's an equal opposite reaction, like for example, whenever a cup is pulled down, it's gotta be pushed up by a table. That would be insane because if that were a law, it would be a law. And that would mean, if that's what the law means, that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, that would mean that nothing could ever fall or move. It would mean any time I take a pen and like I let it go, then it, if that were a law that for the action of gravity, there has to be an equal and opposite upward push on the pen, then the pen would always be sitting still. It would never fall, but it does fall. There is no law that, and again, I'm not yelling this at Yasmin or anybody in the room. I'm yelling this at like, at life. Like, please understand that the Newton's third law does not say that if something is pulled down, it must automatically be pushed up with the same amount of force. If that were true, that would mean that all forces always cancel each other out if it's a law, right? And nothing would ever accelerate. That is not what the law means. Like, that's why I don't like saying for every, and again, Yasmin didn't say this, but notice I didn't write, like, I'm going to, I don't like on, like this law does not say for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's way too vague and it way too much sound. And it is not true that the downward force of gravity on the cup is the action and the normal force up from the desk is the reaction. Not at all. The normal force up from the desk is not a reaction to gravity, even though it's called normal, which is a very deceptive word and makes everybody think that. What this law says, and I know there's three minutes left and I have to post the, the thing. So I'm going to like stop in like one second. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, yeah, that was Yasmin. Okay. Um, uh, that was great. Um, oh, what the law says, and it is a law, like there's no exception to this, really. Like literally, this is a law. It's not just like a description of something we sort of noticed and that. No, it's a law that says if I push you, if object A pushes object B with a certain amount of force in a certain direction, then necessarily object B pushes back on object A with the exact same force, but in the opposite direction. In other words, what law three is saying, it's reinforcing the fact that first of all, to talk about forces, we've got to have two objects in mind, two. There's no such thing as the cup having a force of weight or having a force of normal. A, a force is, uh, do I want to write? Yeah, I'm going to, I know we're just about to end, but what I'm saying about Newton's third law is With like one minute left, let me say that what Newton's third law is really telling you what a force is. A force is an interaction between two objects. It is an interaction between like a subject and an object, so to speak, um, between two actual real objects like planet Earth and cup or cup and table or table and calculator. A force is an interaction between two objects and a force is necessarily a symmetric interaction. Just like meaning, for example, like I married my wife on October 20th, 2012, right? I married my wife on October 20th, 2012. Like that's true. Now, if I then say to you, guess what? You want to hear something really weird? Actually, my wife also married me on October 20th, 2012. Like you'd be like, yeah, dude, of course. Like that's the whole point of marriage, right? That's what we're saying about forces. If I push you, what we're saying is there's a push between you and me. If I push you that way, then you necessarily push me the other way. A force is a symmetric interaction between two objects. It can't go one way without the other. In other words, the Newton's third law, and this is where I'll stop. I see it's 12.05 and I'll put the game assignment in like right after we're done. If what we're saying is if the earth is pulled down on the cup, then the cup is necessarily pulling up on the earth. That's what Newton's third law is saying. Or if you want to say the desk is pushing up on the cup, then the cup is necessarily pushing down on the desk. It's two, each interaction itself is symmetric. 
like a pull does not equal out a push. If I pull you, you pull me back. If something else pulls me, there's no law that says that you must push me in the opposite direction. That's insane. The law is not about three objects. It's about two. That's what I'm saying. We'll stop right there. I'll put the game assignment in. You guys have been very attentive. There's no new homework or anything like that. I'll get the test back soon. Thank you so much. I'm going to end that because the other people are already starting to come in. Sorry. But I mean, if I could just get like a quick goodbye or something, if that's thank you very much. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And I'm not going to say goodbye. But I'm just going to end so we can thank you. Good job. Yeah. Oh, oh, these are all goodbyes. Right. Okay. Bye. Guys. Bye, Nikai. Bye, Jennifer. Bye, Noelia. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Asia. And thank you, Yasmin. That was great. Bye, Daniel. Thank you very much. Bye, Doreen. Of course, all of you can't hear this because you already left, but thank you. Bye, Catherine. Awesome. Great. Okay.